Um, hi, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Jamie John. Um, what I say in Anishinaabe Moan when I introduce myself is um, Ani Buju, Jamie John Indigenous Makwa Nindodem, Kichuikiwerang um, Anishinaabe, Anishinaabe Akin Nindojaba. Um, and what that means translated to English is uh, roughly, hi, hello, I'm Jamie John. Jamie John is what I call myself. My grandparents are Raymond and Myra John. Um, my mother and my father are Tara John and Arthur Mosqueda. Um, I'm from a place known as Traverse City. Um, I'm of the Bear Clan and I call my tribal nation um, the people of the Big Bay or Kichwikiwaitong and Anishinaabek. Um, but I, on paper, I appear as a duly enrolled citizen of the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians and the United States of America. I'm a multidisciplinary uh, queer and trans artist um, of Korean American and Anishinaabe uh, origin and descent lineage, um, working on and around my ancestral territories. Um, this mural is actually part of Art Path in Lansing. It's site 13, and it tells the story of when the muskrat sacrificed himself to build the world that we recognize as Turtle Island. And that's what a lot of uh, Northeastern um, indigenous nations will refer to you as the North and Central Americas as Turtle Island because of this story. This is another like woodland style painting. I show you some of the art that I that I do. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about how I grew up before I get into more specific or general um, what Anishinaabe art can look like and what it can do and what it has done for us in the past and what it does for us now in our contemporary times. Um, so I have an Anishinaabe mom, but I have a Korean American biological father. Um, he is not in my life for a couple of reasons, but it doesn't really make me sad or anything. Um, art is a way of connecting both of my lineages, especially through this like printmaking and watercolor practice. I'm I'm able to touch on my my East Asian ancestry and lineage, um, and consider history through um, ancestral imagery for Anishinaabe people, um, and the processes and functions of what Anishinaabe art can do. So who are the Anishinaabe? Um, the Anishinaabe have a, um, a couple of creation stories. Um, in this installation, also done by me in construction paper and like wall adhesive, um, we were sent, we, we were said to be lowered from the stars onto what we call, what we know as the East Coast of the United States. Um, so near present day Abenaki Lenape territory, um, around the East Coast, around those islands, is where we started out and where we lived for, for thousands of years. Um, and before, before European arrival, we were given a prophecy from the water um, to uh, a pregnant woman was said to receive a prophecy that led us to um, where food would grow on the water. And that's been wildly, that's been interpreted as our wild rice that grows from the, it's said to grow from the mouth of the Detroit River to the Apostle Islands in Wisconsin is where we encountered it. Um, and that would be our third and seventh stopping place in our great migration from, and that follows, it more or less follows the St. Lawrence River, what we know as the St. Lawrence River um, to, the, to the very end of the Great Lakes. And you'll find an Anishinaabe um, on both sides of the St. Lawrence River. Um, thank you. Um, both sides of these waters, um, and what we know is Canada and both what we know is the United States. You'll find them on both sides of these waters because that's where our wild rice grows. That's where we were led. That's where our prophecy said that we would be, um, and that we would be forever and call our home. And in this, in this installation, you'll also see, um, we call it our seven fires prophecy. Um, it was delivered to us in seven parts. Um, but you'll see our stopping places geographically and the same fire that is carried from the East Coast is the same one that burns 
um, up in the Apostle Islands and in Wisconsin. Um, that fire has never gone out and there's still a fire keeper that tends to that fire today. And what does indigenous art or Anishinaabe art do? Um, so indigenous art serves um, a function. It tells stories. It dis it marks our clans. It marks our responsibilities. It um, it demonstrates our relationships to ecology and to land, um, to our sacred sites, to our ancestors. Um, for example, this painting is called Sky Woman by Autumn Whiteway. And this and my mural depict the same story, but there are still different images, wildly different images. Um, so in this story, the otter, the loon, and the muskrat are the ones who attempt to dive down to the bottom to retrieve the first bits of earth that would become Turtle Island because Sky Woman is falling from her place in the stars. But you'll see these pictographs, birch bark scrolls and rock paintings are the first examples of what we know is like the woodland art period. Um, and a lot of those, will, you'll see those where our thunderbirds and where our underwater uh, panther comes from. Um, those are special, those are story beings to us. Those are powerful medicine beings. Um, they usually are very rarely depicted um, one without the other. So you'll usually see them together. Um, our art practices are to tell stories through sticks to record our histories, to pass down ecological knowledge, to pass down um, generational stories. Um, and our art practices are also very place-based. So they reflect um, our individual and our, um, our tribal relations to land because um, we also don't tell Anish other Anishinaabe that they are wrong. Um, so someone on the other side of the water will probably be told the different story than I am on my side of the peninsula. Um, that's why I always preface things with what I was taught or what I was told or what was given to me was this or what was given to me is this. Um, because I, I know that we're all given different stories and those stories aren't wrong. They're just different. Um, and that's okay. Yeah, without our our underwater panther. Yeah, without our underwater um like serpent sort of creature. Yeah. No, they're yeah, they're they're powerful both like sonic and water. Um, related medicines. Um, so one is our sky being, our thunderbird is our sky being, and our underwater panther will be the one. Um, you'll see a lot of him in near like pictured rocks is where he's spotted most, um, where I think he's most accessible to for the public to actually see. Um, but he is he also he often marks like dangerous waters um, or waters that need an offering before you go out. Um, so that you are protected from from the elements, from 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 the water being saying that you can't come here. Um, but yeah, the powder has the power to say no, and Shipishu lets us know that. Um, but our our artwork served a purpose beyond just being beautiful. Um, and while it is beautiful, um, it, our quill work on our baskets marked what was supposed to go in there or what was being stored. Our medicine bags dictated our place in our lodge settings. Our regalia designs came from our grandmas and our grandma's grandmas. And all of our stories are passed down through these various art forms. This is one of our birch bark scrolls. Um, this one is actually in, in justly held by the British Museum. Um, but it does originate from, um, it says Ottawa territory. Um, so it's probably either Minnesota or Wisconsin, but um, the, the do pick, they do depict um, both our serpents, our water beings, and our thunderbird in this, in this painting. These are some cool work examples. 
we are very, very intricate craftsmen, craftsmanship that took years and years to develop that were passed down by aunties, by grandmas, by uncles and cousins, um, by sisters and brothers. Um, so both of the, all of these like geometric designs um, or floral designs, um, they all served a purpose and reflected our relationship to those elements which I think is really special because you'll never see a birch bark basket that looks just alike or one that has been um, copied or, or is the same. More examples of our medicine bags, both a historic one and a more contemporary sort of, sort of one that's done in birch bark and leather. And I don't hear this a lot said, but I, I, we were the like America's like first fashion designers because our our regalia and our medicine bags and our 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 outfits were made for one of a kind use for ceremonial use for, um, for functionality for to to say that someone was loved. Um, you put work into something because you love someone or because you want to look good. Um, but these are examples of what we would use maybe if we, these are otter or beaver. Um, the first two are otter, and then I believe, um, I believe those are otter, all otter actually. And otter are special too, because this is, so this would be a medicine bag reserved for someone of high status in, in lodge or uh, of clan membership. Um, that otter is a really special animal because it is the one that goes between the water and the land. It's a spirit that can travel between the living and the dead um, in between these two worlds um, and can inhabit and bring messages back and forth. Um, so this would have been reserved for a very highly respected, highly revered um, medicine person or caregiver of of a family or of of a of a tribal nation. And then these are who knows what a bandolier bag is or like has seen one before. Seen them? Yeah. Um, so these bandolier bags, um, a lot of them will feature florals, and these florals are reflected through our changes in ecology from a lot of them will, I think it's interesting because it categorizes like changes in ecology through French influence, um, especially with our rapidly changing materials through a trade of copper, of beaver, of baskets, of quill work, um, we were able to get satin ribbons, uh, different fabrics that we were working with. Um, we were able to obtain glass beads and that had never been worked with before. So this was a relatively new art form. Um, so you'll see, and it, it also makes me feel good because about maybe not being so good at beadwork because at one time it was a new art form for our ancestors as well. Um, before we were using, we would use, and we still do use um, shells, bone, teeth, um, uh, animals, um, but every part of, no part of the animal goes to waste. Um, very ecologically focused. And if it is, um, if it can't be used, it usually goes back to the ground. It goes back to the ground in one shape or form. These are more of our contemporary beaded florals because we're still using, a lot of us still use glass beads in our contemporary regalia that you can see at powwow or in ceremonial settings if you're invited. Um, but more often, um, dance outfits and regalia will be specific to, to that person, to that family, to, um, to that someone that's wearing it. These are more examples of like an Anishinaabe and uh, often like Métis outfits. 
Um, Métis are another indigenous group of people that we often live closely next to. Um, Métis and Cree designs, you'll see a lot of similarities in between because we occupied a lot of, we overlapped in a lot of our same territories. Um, and then out more, the more west you get, you'll see the overlap in Nakota and Lakota designs, um, a mix of teepees and uh, dome lodges, um, because that's we would butt up against uh, plains territories and we would often intermix and overlap and share resources. But these are all examples of indigenous artworks and Great Lakes imagery. Um, I don't really love feeding into this idea of like pan Indianism. Um, I like to really assert that these these florals, these Im this imagery belongs to Anishinaabe people. Um, we also work again. We work with copper, birch bark, animal furs, teeth, quills, um, shells, beads, bones. Um, and many contemporary artists work with not only traditional materials, um, but also painting, printmaking, sculpture, poetry, filmmaking, fashion, and installation. Um, yeah. But I really like to assert that, um, assert that these florals, these imagery, this imagery belongs, belongs from, belongs to and originated from Anishinaabe people and Northeastern indigenous folks um, versus like Southwestern folks would be more weavers and silversmiths. And they have their own specific imagery that belongs to desert ecology, um, that belongs to their stories that can be equally as loved and appreciated up here, um, but maybe shouldn't be, should be left for um, Southwestern indigenous people to work with to, um, to assert and find um, in their own artworks um, versus the Anishinaabe imagery that I continually come back to and the stories that I use frequently. This is one of the, well, not one of the first, but it was one of um, one of the biggest names in, um, in indigenous artworks from, from like the 1960s onward is Norval Morso. Uh, who is an Anishinaabe pa painter. He was one of, um, he is known for his very large depictions of and interpretations of our birch bark scrolls, of our stories, of our paintings. This one is called Androgyny. Um, you'll see again our Thunderbird and our Horned Serpent, um, our water animals and tons of people um, reflecting our place in ecology in this, um, this gender bending sort of way that I really enjoy. Another one of my favorites, man changing into Thunderbird. And this is a sixth panel large scale painting series. And you'll find that a lot of Anishinaabe um, stories involve this sort of shape shifting. Um, this sort of changing into spirit, changing into animal la landmark, landform, um, back into human body um, that I really enjoy, that I find connects with me as like a queer and trans person a lot. Carl Ray is another in, uh, First Nations Anishinaabe painter. Um, Jason Quigno is a, is a stone sculptor. This is his sculpture, Clans of the Anishinaabek, that you can find in Grand Rapids. Um, but he is part of the Saganachipua tribe um, around here. And he is being awarded the, um, the Legacy Award from the Michigan Legacy Art Park this year. The painting that I showed you, I was commissioned to make his award and the first large scale watercolor painting is the award that I made him. And that reflects all our clan animals as well, our hummingbird and our deer, um, the bear and the sturgeon and the turtle um, and the loon. Lois Beardsley is one of my favorites. She works as not only a painter, but also a birch bark biter, um, an illustrator and a writer. Um, Lois Beards, I like to highlight indigenous women artists um, because I don't feel that they're recognized enough and they're not given 
enough of a voice in in typical um, art settings. Um, but indigenous women are often the backbones of our communities. They are carrying the one, they're the ones carrying our traditions. They're the ones carrying our art forms. Um, at one time, Lois Beardsley was one of two or three birch bark biters who were working on the peninsula and has since brought that art form back um, to, to a lot of other people, both indigenous and non-indigenous. And she reflects our stories as well and, and knowledge that, that comes from ecology, that comes from the land that she, that she calls her home. This is some of our more contemporary beadwork. Um, here on Hill Designs from Joey and Daniel are two uh, queer bead workers and regulated designers. Um, you can see that they still use uh, the elk teeth and glass beads um, and rely on you know ancestral imagery um, pretty heavily. I really enjoy them. Black ash baskets are another thing that you'll find the Anishinaabe people are are known for or that do we do particularly very well. Um, Kelly Church is is a beautiful, very skilled master of birch bark, uh, of birch of birch bark and black ash basket designs. Um, these are two that are, I believe, owned by the Smithsonian of the National American Indian. This is an award-winning quill work piece that I that is from um I tried to highlight um maker indigenous Anishinaabe makers from Michigan. So um unless I state otherwise, um all of these uh these makers will be from from Michigan. Jillian Waterman is a contemporary fashion designer working in both traditional materials and uh, you know, screen printing, um, fashion design, um, birch bark, earring making. Um, and then not only do we do traditional like painting, but there's also um, like digital artworks that we make that reflect our stories and reflect where we come from and the knowledge that we have. Does anyone have any questions at all or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. For sure. And I'm really struck by how much For sure. And and sometimes um that is such like sometimes I also have to figure out what I'm looking at when I'm when I'm looking at another a story that I might not know or a story that um, wasn't given to me directly. Um, and I think that that's um, such is when you're passing down knowledge, um, like the story of how this place became Turtle Island I've heard since I was a young kid. So depicting that I'm I'm very comfortable with, I'm very comfortable telling that story um, and letting other people and gifting that story to other people as well. Um, but if I also take comfort in knowing that there's still knowledge that has to be passed down to me that I may not know yet. Um, and that there are stories um there are stories from ancestors inside of me that i still have to figure out um but trying to even gather as much information as you can from from the art piece that you're looking at from from the maker um even like identifying sometimes you can get their nation or where they're from um or who their family is um and oftentimes it's not just ancestral stories, it's also a mixture of both our 
our stories and our individual experiences as artists that I very much enjoy. Um, and sometimes it can be hard to differentiate. Um, but yeah, but being able to even like construct what this story might be about or, um, or infusing like your own lived experience into what you're looking at is, is also a great way to engage with indigenous art styles. Yeah. Yeah, the woodland art period, if that's the... Um, it usually, oh, I'm super bad with dates. Um, a couple hundred years, probably, um, until we were able to probably get, um, so Woodland Art also covers like our floral designs, our, not just like our rock paintings, but also like our floral designs that have translated, um, that have been translated to tons of different mediums. Um, so you could say that the Woodland Art period is still maybe going on. Um, like through painting, through cool work, through regalia making, um, through digital design like this, like Hadassah's right here. Um, usually what um, what uh, makes woodland art like what it is, is usually those like thick, dark, um, these thick, dark lines that are referencing our birch bark scrolls, our carvings. Um, Often those that black comes from having charcoal sort of rubbed into the into the birch bark scroll, so they appear better and are archived in a more um, sustainable way um, for others to read. Um, but yeah, I think I think that you could say that woodland art is still very much going on. If that makes sense, but it was it's actively like archaeologically like only a couple a couple hundred years, maybe like four hundred. I I wouldn't know it at the top of my head. I'm so sorry. For sure. Not only beautiful, but it's also from the Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's shifted a bit, uh, especially um, especially with living in a world that prioritizes certain artworks and maybe doesn't give as much value or weight to ancestral knowledge as. Um, as the world we lived in once did. Um, and then I I think that a lot of woodland art can be misinterpreted as just like a, a pretty art style or a pretty picture, um, which it is. It makes beautiful pictures um, and it does make um, beautiful art pieces. Um, but I think that woodland art as like a translation device or a mnemonic device um, such as it was in our birch park scrolls, in our um, in our practices of passing down stories and ecological knowledge, sometimes gets a little lost in contemporary art settings. Yeah, of course. So I was thinking that I would tell a story while I give a little painting demo, show you what I what I use, what I use for like inspiration and stuff, if that's okay. Cool. Yeah. So the story, one of my one of the stories that I heard growing up was of the muskrat and sky woman. Um Sky Woman was young and she was pregnant with twins. And she went to investigate a hole in the sky that had come from an uprooted tree. And 
and Earth was still young at that time, so it was covered in water most everywhere. And Sky Woman fell to the Earth with her medicine bun and her medicine bundle spilled. She had so all of the seeds that she had, she had saved, seeds of strawberries and tobacco and cedar and corn and squash had all scattered to the bottom of the water as she fell. And the first animals to notice her were the birds. And the birds let out a sound so the water animals would know that someone was coming, that someone was falling to earth and that they would need they would need help. And then the, the animals that could swim gathered around this great turtle and they decided that they would take chan they that they would take turns deciding who would go to the bottom to retrieve the earth that would become Sky Woman's resting place. Sorry, folks, trying to do th two things at the same time is harder than I thought it would be. Um, at first, the beaver went and he took a great big breath and he dove down beneath the surface of the water. He wasn't gone very long before he had to come back up for air. And he was coughing and he said that he, it's dark down there. I can't really see anything. And the loon said, I'm made for the water and I carry the stars on my back. Let me try to carry, to carry the earth and I will come back and I will place it on turtle's back so that the, that the world can grow and that sky woman may have a place to sit upon. So the loon dove down and was gone for a long time, but he too came back coughing and struggling to breathe he said, it's too dark down there. I couldn't see a thing. But still, there were more animals who were willing to try. As Sky Woman was getting, when Sky Woman was getting closer. And if she did not have a place to rest, she would surely fall. And she would pass away. This is when the otter spoke up. And he said, I am the spirit that goes in between the water and the land, the living and the dead the human and the non-human world. Let me try to retrieve the earth for Sky Woman. And the animals said yes, and they would try, and that they would support Otter trying. And then Otter took a big breath and he disappeared underneath the water, diving down as far as he could and swimming with all of his might. Can you pull your paper down? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, the otter, the otter is down there. The otter is down there. He took a big breath and he tried to swim with all his might to the bottom. But he too came back coughing. And he said, I couldn't make it. He was struggling to breathe. He said, as powerful and sacred as I am, I still cannot see or feel the bottom where the earth is. He coughed and coughed up the water that got into his lungs and he crawled to the top of the great turtle. And the animals knew that Sky Woman would reach the water soon and if she could not swim or have a place to rest her body, that she would surely be in trouble. And the animals looked around to see who else might be able to help Sky Woman when a small voice spoke up. And he said, I can swim, let me try. And that small voice belonged to our muskrat. And some of the animals were scared for muskrat. Some of the others laughed at him. Thinking that he couldn't do it. But even still, he gathered up all of his strength and he asked Skitchy Manitou, the great spirit, 
to watch over him and his journey as he dove down. On top of the great turtle, the animals sat and they waited, watching Sky Woman fall through the air and praying for Muskrat to come back. But Muskrat was gone for a very long time. And the animals began to wonder if they would ever see him again. Just then, the loon, the otter, and the beaver noticed the body of Muskrat who had floated to the top, his body exhausted from swimming and his lungs barely breathing. But in his paw, the other animals saw a little bit of earth from the bottom that he was able to retrieve. The rest of the animals rushed over and the crowd and took a crowd around his little body. And the great turtle spoke up and said, put Muskrat on my back on the back of my shell. I will carry him in the earth in his paw and this will build the new world where Sky Woman will live her life. And this is the story of how we got to call the North and Central America's Turtle Island. So in many stories, Muskrat dies, but in other stories, he stays alive. But in every story, he is underestimated. Um, and in every version that I've heard, it's the Muskrat that brings about this new world. But this is just an idea of what our stories might do and what they might function as for both historical and contemporary times. These are the paints that I use. So these are made by Anishinaab First Nations paint makers from Manitoulin Island. They're wrapped in paper that is from uh, indigenous, indigenous lumber workers. Um, the old ones are wrapped in beeswax. So I have an older palette and I have a newer palette. Um, but I can sh we can start painting if you guys like. Well, we could always have started painting, but I'll paint with you. Um, yeah. It's farther down than I think it is. For big areas like this, I like to do a wash. Yeah, so we're gonna to um, take our paintbrush into clear water and spread it around the area that we would like to see one color it's usually one color sometimes i usually do a two it works well for if you want to do like a gradient um i think i'm going to do a blue to purple gradient here so i want our water to be purple then we take our color the color that we want And it makes nice blooms too. This is this is just watercolor paper. I'm using Strathmore watercolor paper, cold press. The smaller pieces of paper that are on the desk are watercolor paper.
And then I'm going to use some of some of my purple to get a gradient. Is this experience that tells you how far it's going to Um, sometimes like washes like this or or having it bloom is a bit unpredictable. But I kind of like that the water will do what it wants to do. Um, I was taught that water has a spirit, has a life, and um, and like a purpose, um, like a sense of being. Um, so being being allowed to let the water do what it does on its own, I find is really almost kind of relaxing um, or makes me feel like I only have to translate what it wants to do instead of maybe like acrylic where I have to really work for what the paint wants to say or um, what the image is gonna come out like. Um, but I feel like I have to do that so much less with watercolors. Do you guys know, I don't know if you see many jokes about natives, but I feel like a joke that I hear a lot is that we'll like slam the brakes or like crash the car trying to look at an eagle. Um, but we, we do have a story about why, why eagles are so special to us, why they are so, why they are so sacred. Um, and it connects to our, to our flood stories. I also think that I'm, uh, I think water is important in that way because we have so many stories about water. Um, I grew up as a water carrier um, through, through Medewin Lodge, um, which is, you know, an, an Anishinaabe specific, um, sort of societal, um, you know, clan system or, or lodge setting, um, lodge ceremonial, um, medicinal, um, society. Um, but being a water carrier from a young age and participating in ceremony, um, having a relationship with water that is built on respect, that is built on uh, reciprocity, that is built um, to be loving, to be um, to be cared for, to be nurtured. Um, I think also, um, I think also weirdly like helps you paint with watercolors, your relationship with water. Um, and if your your relationship with water is based in extraction, or if it's um, polluting, or or if you treat water, you know, badly, then um, you know the water knows. Um, yeah, eagles eagles are pretty special to us, um, but it connects to another flood story that we have. And in this story, our our great the great creator Gichi Manitou was going to flood out the world. Um, he was going to flood out the world, and he was going because the Anishinaabe that were here were not living in a way that they were supposed to be. Um, they had forgotten to pray to the water. They had forgotten to do their sunrise ceremony. They had forgotten to offer tobacco um, for gathering medicines. Um, they had forgotten to live along with the land. Um, and what another thing that is that I think is very cool is that um, we have stories about, not only do we have stories about the end of the world, but we have stories about 
the end of the world happening at least four times before this one, at least four times before the world we live in now that we recognize today. Um, but this one is when the eagle saved the world. Um, the Anishinaabe creator couldn't find any Anishinaabe that were living in the way that they were supposed to be. Um, and he said, I'm going to flood them out. I'm going to start all over. Um, you know, I can't do it. I can't find anybody who's living in the way that they're supposed to be. And McGizzy felt bad and he felt terrible. Um, you can't, you can't wipe out everybody. Not, not like this. And he gave creator, he said to creator, um, get you Manitou. I'm a Gizzy. If I cannot find someone by sunrise who is living in the way that they're supposed to be, either offering medicines to the plants that they pick or singing a song or dancing or doing sunrise ceremony, then I will, I will let you flood out. I will let you flood out the world. Um, and I won't fight you. I won't fight you about it. And if I, if I can't, then, then I'll even help you. Um, and creator said, okay, McGizzy, I'll give you until sunrise, sunrise the next day. And that wasn't a lot of time for McGizzy because he had to fly all the way around the world for, to find an Anishinaabe who was doing so, who was trying to live right. Um, but he saw what, he saw what creator was talking about. People had forgotten how to live, uh, you know, in reciprocity, um, they had forgotten their stories. And I always look, I, I feel like I'm drawn to stories where we lose our way because they're either we don't or we find our way back somehow. It might take a little while, but we always find our way back somehow. But create, but because he had to search all night, and he knew that morning was coming, and he had only made it a certain a certain amount of time, and he still had so much ground to cover, and he was starting to get worried, and he was starting to panic, and he feel and he was feeling like he was gonna lose, like he was really gonna lose out the world that he loved so much and the people that he loved so much, because they couldn't find a way to live in reciprocity with this land that they had been given. And McGizzy flew higher and higher and he started to get short of breath and he started to get dizzy. <sighs> and the Thunderbird is the bird that's said to fly the highest. He's said to fly the highest because he is the one that carries our prayers up to Crater, up to the skies, up to our thunders. Um, and he is the one that sees, sees all. He can see the most because he's up in the sky. And because he starts to get short of breath and he doesn't feel like he's going to make it. And he knows that he's going to lose and the world that he loves is going to be gone. Um, but just as the sun starts to peak up, peak up over the horizon line, that's when, when McGizzy spots someone offering tobacco to the sun and take out their drum and sing a song and do their sunrise ceremony. And I guess he lets out a big screech, a screech so loud that you had never heard anything like it before. And Creator hears it and he sees McGizzy's wings light up and his wingspan has become so big that he is turned into a Thunderbird through this act of helping the Anishinaabe, he is transformed. And Creator says, you know what, right? McGizzy, you were right. I, I was wrong. And as long as one person is living the way that they're supposed to be, then I still have hope for them. But yeah, eagles are super special to us. They saved us.
I've seen eagles on the way to Ann Arbor. Uh, yeah. That's so cool. That's awesome. Yes, they do. Oh, no, ask me questions, please. I am. Yeah. Mm How do you do that? So I'm also, along with being a watercolor, primarily a watercolor painter, I'm also a printmaker. A lot of the art that you'll see here is printmaking. Um, so it, being able to work on paper that originates from uh, from Korea, like rice paper, um, is able, I'm able to keep that connection with my lineage. Um, block printing and relief printing also have a pretty rich history in East Asia. Um, so using block printing techniques, but also relying on um, indigenous imagery from, from where I grew up and my lived experience um, allows me to um to still maintain that connection even without any uh ties to like my korean biological family um and also just just learning my own history and the history of the of the peninsula both north and south um it both you know of michigan and of um the korean peninsula um especially experiencing the, considering the fam, the similarities in unequal treaty making with uh, Japan and the repeated invasions of the peninsula. Um, I'm able to connect through um, like current Korean, uh, Korean American artists who have a working knowledge of, of, um, of their history, of their family lineage. Um, and that has really helped me heal from not having any Korean family, I guess. Um, but yeah, and also, um, so Anishinaabe, two food staples of Anishinaabe people are fish and rice, um, are white fish and wild rice. Um, so being able to come from a geography that is that emphasizes both fish and rice that is two peninsulas, um, I think is very special. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, yeah. Um, so like Bong Joon-ho is one of my favorite directors um, and he's, uh, from Korea and was a student during their push for democracy. Um, so he has a working knowledge of what happened prior, what happened after, um, and has been, has a working knowledge of both US history as well. So is able to draw similarities between the two continents of, um, in their history of both war, displacement, um, colonialism, but also um, like land-based practices and um and ancestral strength and ancestral healing and um the good parts that come with having such a big family and ancestors to rely on um it was I don't know if it was the same technique but um it was all sort of done in one color one sort of go
But if you do the sort of the wet on wet, you'll get a lot of this blooming that you see here. Yeah. And then it especially is nicely contrasted when you have two colors. <laughs> Yeah. So it looks like you're doing a bigger part of the illustration for the book. Yeah. And then along with washes, there's also paint, watercolor paintings that look like this. Geometric. Yeah. Something geometric that can require this one requires some precision. I say some a lot. Um, but just something different that watercolor is able to do. And these are. I don't know how many of you guys, do you guys know what a powwow is? Yeah. Um, so I'm a powwow dancer. I have been for a really long time. Um, I'm primarily a jingle dress and a hoop dancer. Um, well, I think it's cool too. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, my, if you have, if you see one of my little business cards, that one has a little uh, picture of a jingle dress dancer on it. Um, but that, I was, I was the head dancer for the, the U of M's powwow, Dance to Mother Earth powwow. Yeah, I was there. Um, me and Badaske Stonefish were, were the head dancers for that powwow. Um, but yeah, I, I really enjoy jingle dress dancing, but those are two, um. There weren't very many young people. No, there was a lot of older dancers. More older ones. I agree. Some of the classes didn't have anybody. Else. Yeah, I mean, I saw the power committee, but it was mostly young folks, but yeah. um, not a lot of folk, like younger folks in regalia I didn't see. Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, but I, I grew up going to powwows all over the Great Lakes area. And I didn't realize until I was older, but the Great Lakes region is known for some of ha having some of the best uh, traditional powwows. Um, a lot of them have changed to competition powwows now, but um, I like traditional powwows still. I do go to Wapo Island sometimes. Yeah, that's cool. it's all outdoors and mm -hmm. really, I just carry home in the Pouring down rain in the storm. <laughs> yeah, open. <laughs> Hello, we're going to take it. <laughs> um, but who maybe doesn't know what a powwow is or has never been to one? Yeah, so it's where, um, so a bunch of us have different dances that range from uh, like our jingle dress style to our hoop dance um, that are all specific to our nations like you'll sometimes see like a chicken dance or a fancy feather dance um for for men for young men or i really like watching grass dancers um oh yes they get that whole thing just swinging <laughs> <laughs> oh like golden age dancers yeah um oh fancy shawl that long and they're just Get that thing Heck yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but our powwows, um, when we we get we get together, like uh, like around these time this time of year, the summer months, we get together. Um, all different natives of all different tribal nations, we come together and we celebrate those dances. We celebrate our veterans and we celebrate our foods and um, we celebrate our togetherness and the fact that we're all still here and able to celebrate our joy um, through through dancing. And that's where I see, when I talk about like those beadwork and those regalia designs, that's where I see them a lot. So a lot of these geometric paintings are inspired by um, by those um, by those designs there that I see there. Um,
And there's not a lot of, um, there might be more hoop dancers um, the farther south I go, but around where I'm from, there's not too many hoop dancers anymore. Um, my my teacher, Budrick Day, is from Minnesota, is an Anishinaabe from Minnesota. Um, but he is the one that taught me how to dance, hoop dance, my style. And I was always told that to be a jingle dress dancer, you have to be gifted your dress or you have to have a dream about your dress. Um, and that's how I've always, um, that's how I've always done it. I've only ever, I've only ever gotten a new dress when I've had a dream. Um, and I've only ever gifted my, my dress to other people who have had uh, a jingle dress dream. Um, but the story, I really like the story of the hoop dance that comes from this area, the, around this, this area, around the Michigan area. Um, he wasn't the first one to write it down, but he was one of the first recorders of the of the story. Um, Basil Johnson was one of the, the people who wrote down our hoop dance story. Um, but there, not too very long ago, there was a there was a young boy, um, and he wasn't much older than say double digits. wasn't older than much older than ten. Um, but he he really wasn't interested in war games. He really liked to birch bark bite. He liked to gather berries. He wasn't really interested in lacrosse or hunting or um, anything that involved really housing. He wasn't very much into. Um, and he was nicknamed the boy that nobody did, um, which is really sad. Um, he was nicknamed the boy that nobody wanted, and he spent the time out with the trees and reading with, uh, listening to the forest talk. And one day when he was in the woods, he received, he heard the trees talking to him. He heard the redwood tree talking to him, or the dogwood tree, I guess, I think is what it was called. Um, but he, the dogwood tree said to him that for every flower bloom, for every flap of a bird's wing, for every animal that you can see and tell a story about, I want you to make a hoop out of one of my my limbs, out of one of my, my wooden pieces. Um, I want you to break off one of my limbs and use it to tell a story. Um, and he did, and he... Uh, you'll see, so, uh, I only dance with about seven hoops, but sometimes you'll see dancers with up to 15, 20. I've seen people dance with 32 hoops. It's pretty crazy. Um, but you'll you'll see that story both um, around this area, around the Great Lakes area, and around um, Southwestern uh, tribal territories like um, Arizona, New Mexico, um, up into uh, Utah um, is, an, is where that story occurs elsewhere, um, where hoop dancers often um, reside and come from as well. But that young, that young boy who started hoop dancing was able to bring, the, bring this dance back to his own village and show other boys how to do this dance. And it was usually young boys who did this dance. It was, it's known as like a showmanship dance, um, but it's not uncommon for, for women to do this dance as well. And that's how, that's how I started out. I was in um, the youth girls category prior to, and then stopped dancing for a little while um, before I medically transitioned and started dancing again. Color do you like? You want a dark green or green? Oh, I'll go with this one. Yes. Okay. Light green and white? Yes.
Did you say you needed five? How many of you guys are familiar with the Jingle Dress Dancer story or the origin of where that came from? No, nobody? Yeah. Yeah, there are. Yeah, they're rolled tobacco, um, tobacco lids. Yeah, the tins. Um, but that sound um, is said to be our, our prayers. Um, because for every tobacco tin that is rolled and put onto that dress, a prayer is said to be, is a prayer is said. Yeah, 365 or something like that. I don't know where we get that teaching. That teaching was never passed down to me. Okay. Yeah, some people do do 365 um, cones for every day. Um, I was also taught that we, uh, that's not our traditional way of calendar keeping either. Um for example, for twenty for twenty eight days, there's thirteen moons, um, and that would be our be our calendar, be our seasonal our calendar. Um, every twenty eight days, we would be. I think I believe we're in the strawberry moon right now. Um, so yeah. June is like our strawberry moon month, and then next will be our corn moon, maybe raspberry moon in our area little bit for the north down here okay um yeah but though that um those like moon names will be different for for even other like northeastern indigenous communities even communities around the same in the same state or the same territory um but in in august near august is our is our rising moon um because that would be our rising season also the, the, uh, they're in different uh, designs yeah the moon or the rice the jingles. Oh, the jingles, yes. Yeah, they're all, yeah, they're not exactly, everyone does not leave it. <laughs> they're never, they're not all the same pattern on the dress. Nope. Nope. 